Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the U3A radio podcast, which increasingly is also being listened to on several podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple, and Google. Although U3As usually meet once a month, it's the groups that are at the heart of the organization. And this month, we feature several of the more unusual ones. I'm Nick Bailey, and in this edition, we learn about classic cars, and we go axe-throwing in Leicestershire. Axe-throwing, yes. Well, that was one that we did have to do as an organised activity, obviously. I, I, I checked our insurance, and although the Third Age Trust covers us for most activities, that was one of the kind of high-risk things that we had to do as an organised event. We meet the man who can whistle happy birthday through a carrot. <laughs> and we're introduced to the U3A anthem. Maybe it's because I'm a pensioner that I love you, 3A. If you're a budding writer, the deadline for this year's annual U3A writing competition is on June the 16th. One of the judges is Alison Owen, who's the editor of the best-selling Writers and Artists Yearbook, which provides advice and contacts for authors across all forms on how to write and get published. Ella Watts caught up with Alison and asked if it's ever too late to become a writer. I don't think it's ever too late to become anything. And what I would say about writers they're often writing about experience, about a lived life. So the longer you live a life, the chances are the greater number of experiences you have. So absolutely not. And your listeners probably know Mary Wesley. She was 71 when she published her debut novel called Jumping the Queue. And Paul Torday, his first novel after a very successful career, age 59, Salmon fishing in the Yemen. So no, it's never too late to become a debut writer. Brilliant. Can you tell me a little bit about the most mature writer that you've ever supported? Yes. Yeah, so in my role as the editor of the yearbook, I commission a whole range of writers and experts for other writers to learn all about the writing process. Um, and I'm delighted that at the age of about 98, Diana Attill, who was born in 1917, wrote a brilliant article about her life as being an editor. But in her later years, so over the age of 80, she started to write books and she wrote her first memoir, I think when she was 82, and she wrote a subsequently five more memoirs after that. That's the other brilliant thing that older writers can bring to writing is writing about their lives, what they've experienced throughout the 20th century um, and beyond. So she was a particularly special writer. And I should perhaps just highlight the fact that people really are looking for older writers. So there's two particular prizes I was going to mention uh, to your listeners. One is the Paul Torday Memorial Prize, and that's for debut novelists over the age of 60. And perhaps even more exciting, uh, which has a prize of £10,000 a year, the Royal Society of Literature um, awards the Christopher Bland Prize for a writer over the age of 50 every year. So it's really worth looking for what other people are looking for in terms of writing from, shall we call them more mature writers who have a lot of experience under their belt. So how would you sum up what these more mature writers actually bring to the storytelling? Well, actually, Diana Attill, in her, I, I'm just going to quote from her in the article she wrote for me, um, and she talks a lot about the experience she had of being an editor, so the life experience, which I've already mentioned. But the, she also said, I suspect that reading a lot and also being taught as a child how to pass a sentence played a large part in me becoming a writer. I, I suppose what she's saying there is, if you have a lot of time to read what other people are writing, so what good writers you learn through that, and therefore the longer you live a life, the more books you will have read, which can imbibe your own or influence your own writing. So the more books you've read, the more books you can write. Well, the more books you can choose not to write like or to take on board the best kinds of writing, I guess so. I think um, like any skill, really, you hone your skill by seeing the way that other people have done it before. That's not to say we don't have fantastic writers who are writing when they're really young. But, you know, all of us bring our lives to what we're writing. And therefore, if you've lived more of a life and you've lived through stages of history, those are interesting things that other people might want to read about. 
you're also a judge, Alison, for the annual U3A Creative Writing Competition. What's the most rewarding part of being one of those judges? I think there's two aspects. One is just discovering some fantastic new writing. It's really hard to write a short story and to be able to bring to that not only characterization and, and a sense of storyline, something that's going to excite the reader, that's going to grab you with the first line or the first um, paragraph, that's also going to keep you reading. That's a real skill. So finding stories that really do grab your attention is, is a great delight. But I think the other side of that is also working in communion with other people in the U3A. So with the other judges um, who are experienced creative writing tutors who run U3A groups across the country. That has been a really um, exciting experience, sitting down with them, arguing about our top placed stories, making the case for the stories that we selected and that they've selected. So I think just being part of a broader group of people who care about good writing. Alison Owen. The 2022 Creative Writing Competition, in partnership with Bloomsbury, is now open. We're looking for a maximum of 1,500 words, and this year the theme is opening or openings. You can find all the details, including the rules and how to submit your entry, on our website at u3a.org.uk forward slash learning. And the deadline is the 16th of June. If creative writing feeds the mind, how about a group that makes whistles out of carrots, which can then be eaten. Matt Carroll is the convener of the Natural History Group at Swansea U3A, and he demonstrated his carrot whistle to Sarah Goodall. Right. Well, actually, Matt, that carrot tune, it wasn't too bad. How on earth did you come up with that idea? Well, originally, I've, um, I made the carrot for the carrot whistle for a three-year-old boy. And uh, he wanted to play it, and he couldn't. He couldn't blow it. He couldn't get a note. So he ate it. So I had to make another one. And then I thought I'd make a video about how do you make a carrot whistle. So um, and then you 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 shared it with Swansea U three A. I put it on YouTube. I've got my own little YouTube channel, and yeah. I always send it to my natural history group to all the members, and it goes as a link on the U three A website. So running a natural history group, when it came to lockdown and you could no longer go out for walks, it must have been a struggle to think of things to do with the members. Well, we couldn't do anything. We weren't allowed to leave our houses. So I, that's when I started making videos. And uh, the early ones are so bad. <laughs> They're terrible. Um, but I have a friend in Scotland and she's a film editor. So she's given me an awful lot of help and advice. So every time I do a video, she comments on it and uh, they've improved bit by bit by bit. So I try and use a different technique every, every, every video. What sort of subjects have you covered then, Matt? Well, I started out with pond dipping. Um, and then I looked at dandelions and making nettle soup. And I've progressed. Um, I've got time lapse videos, and I've been using a camera trap, a trail camera. But quite a few of the um, quite a few of the videos about greenwood uh, greenwood working and um, woodland crafts, charcoal making, and that sort of thing. So I've been working along with a bushcraft company. So I've done a bit on cooking in on a fire, and I'm just at the moment doing a series on churchyards so the north gower churches but the yards the, the, the church and graveyards not the church so the wildlife and the sound of a church oh that sounds lovely must remember to tune into that what's been the reaction from the members of your group how have they responded they like it um some of them uh will send it on to their grandchildren and their own kids um but I usually get some nice comments back. And whenever I meet up now with them, they nearly all have seen them and comment. But I try and make them scientific as, you know, factual. Uh, so I'm trying to give out some information that they might not have as well. And are you all back out walking again? Is your group back out walking again? We're back out walking. We had a bird song identification session um, a couple of weeks ago. Before that, we had a workshop session making nest boxes 
Um, we've been out onto the cliff tops down at Muslade. And the next session will be in a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, and it will be an evening session um, uh, record, uh, listening for bats. How many members have you got? It sounds like you're doing something really popular there. Yeah, I, on on the books, there's 70. Um, not everyone is physically able, so quite a few of the places I go are... Rocky Shore, for example, it's slippy and it's rocky. Mm. So I have to really make sure people understand what the terrain is like, because mm. um, I really don't want to have an accident. Which is why the videos are perfect, aren't they? Because if people can't come out, it doesn't mean they can't enjoy the natural world. In yeah, their home. yeah. But I, I, with, with the bird song, for example, um, the one I've just done, most people hear bird song all the time, but can't separate them out. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do, just to get them to know one or two bird song, and then once they've got to start them. Oh, I'll be tuning in for that, definitely. So, yeah. so just to um, round up here, Matt, are you planning any more musical instruments of an unusual um, nature? Well, I've got two or three friends who are quite interested in making carrot whistles. You could use an aubergine, like a flute, um, a green pepper. Potato, I think you could make one out of a parsnip. Uh, cucumber, you could probably make one. And then at the end, we would uh, have a stew after we've played our instruments. So after the vegetable orchestra, we have a vegetable stew. Matt Carroll with his carrot orchestra, doing a pretty good stab at happy birthday. And I can't wait to hear, and maybe eat, his aubergine flute. And from musical vegetables to a sing-along group. For the last six years, 85-year-old David Becker from Mill Hill U3A in northwest London has been running a weekly drop-in sing-along class. And he joins me now, along with Vicky Shields, who's one of the regular attenders. So welcome to both of you. Hi, Rob. Thank you, Nick. If I can start with you, David, what prompted you to start these sing-along sessions? I've always been singing, Matt. I used to go on a walking uh, group every week and I used to try and get people to sing. And eventually they passed uh, in uh, the annual general meeting. They said, David Beckham must not sing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but despite that, you decided to start up a group. Uh, well, I was headhunted by the chairperson of the uh, Mill Hill U3A. So tell us what happens in these uh, sing-along sessions. I play the music of... Anyone who they like, like Sinatra, Nat King Cole, if it's Gerald, uh, uh, Helen Shapiro, uh, Alma Cogan, uh, all the shows, yeah, my, uh, my Fair Lady, Oklahoma, West Side Story, we sing everything like that and we just sing along to it. Well, if I can bring Vicky in uh, at this stage. Right. Uh, uh, have you been attending from the start? I know it's been I going for... Indeed, yes. It, it's, it gives you a good uh, feel-good factor, I must say. I met David at uh, U3A, but as a bridge group. We're both very keen bridge players. And that was before he started the singing group. But um, first of all, I went along, you know, as a duty, as I was his girlfriend. But um, I enjoy it. it. It does brighten up your afternoon. And I think all the people there feel the same way. Nick, I want to tell you, for 50 years, her children have told her, their mother, when it comes to singing in public, just mine, because they think she has a terrible, terrible voice. And she, for 50 years, she, she never sang. And I got her on the stage singing at one point. So do you think that's a fair description of your voice, Vicky? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I endorse that. I can't sing. <laughs> but she has a terrific sense of rhythm. Right. So what are your favourite songs? Any song. I like all the wonderful, wonderful songs. Um, I mean, if I, asked, if I asked you to sing, both of you, to sing just a, a, a short snippet of something, maybe from My Fair Lady, what would it be? Uh, on the street where you live, I have often walked down the street before, but the pavements always stay beneath my feet before. All at once am I several stories high, knowing I'm on the street where you live. Now, let me let me give you a, a song I wrote for you, 3A. Ready? Okay. 
Maybe it's because I'm a pensioner that I love you 3A. Maybe it's because I'm a pensioner that I hurry there with little to pay two, three, four. Many, many classes are offered me where I can learn or sing or play two, three, four. Maybe it's because I'm a pensioner Oh, I love you, three. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, that ought to become uh, uh, officially sanctioned. <laughs> a by, national anthem. <laughs> the, the, indeed, indeed. Can I um, uh, refer now to a recent survey uh, that was done? And I think it prompted you, uh, David, to write into uh, sources on the website. And this was a recent survey that was sanctioned by U3A. And they, they took, I think, 2,000 people uh, in the general public and that survey revealed that over half of the public think music tastes should reflect people's age. So that was one survey. And then they did another survey with U3A members. And the majority of U3A members felt that age is not a factor in the music they love. What do you two think? Honestly, they are, those are both correct. Age is not a factor. But instinctively, the, the tunes you learned when you are younger are your favourites, just like you see. We sing Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald. The modern songs for us don't appeal. So although it's not a factor, it's just it, it becomes a preference. But is there any modern music you like at all? We like the Beatles, don't we? And... That's not modern. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, well, you see. In more modern Frank Sinatra. Well, what about these girl singers? Uh, we hardly know any modern. Uh, I mean, what... I've listened to them, but none of them have this the appeal of the heart. I mean, even Madonna. Madonna is mm. the closest I get to uh, uh, listening to modern. You can say that I think our generation would prefer the older songs. Right. So you you actually agree with the general public when it comes to uh, yeah. that. I mean, I quite yeah. I like Adele. I mean, if, if you're counting her as modern, but I mean, I don't like the sort of uh, what's that man? The very loud uh, <laughs> groups that's, what, uh, what's that. What's that boy who tops everything? Oh, uh, Ed Sheeran, I like. Yeah, Ed oh. Sheeran and Adele are, pe- are two of the ones I would like the present day singers. I know, I know nothing about those two. <laughs> right. Well, Vicky, I mean, you're pretty modern. I mean, much more modern than David is. I'm, I'm a ten years younger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're not into punk music or no. garage, no. or garage or anything like no, that. That's David, no, that's David's keep, son. Keep, keep asking. Son. No, forget. Keep asking. The answer is no to everything. Well, it's been a, a great pleasure talking to you both, David Becker and Vicky Shields from Mill Hill U3A uh, in North London. Thank you, and wish you the best of luck and continue success with your sing-alongs. Thank you. Thank Nick. you very much. Bye. Thanks for your time. Bye. 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 Have you ever wanted to embark on something new but haven't found enough people to join you? Well, the New Experiences Group at Harbour Welland U3A in Leicestershire has the answer. Peter Clift spoke to Kevin Millard, who set up the group, and asked if the basic idea was for members to try out new things. It is, Peter, yes. I joined U3A five years ago. And a friend of mine said, you should join U3A. So went along to the meeting. There were the general kind of walking groups and cycling groups and that kind of thing. But nothing very exciting, let's call it. I'd run a youth club when my kids were kind of youth club age. And we'd always done great, interesting stuff like going sailing and climbing walls and that kind of stuff, treasure hunts and things. And I thought, well, you know, why not introduce something like that to the U3A? There was a a, a group's meeting, so I I set up a stall there and about 40 people signed up on the day. Nobody knew what we were going to do, um, but once we'd got that nucleus of people to invite to things, then we could start to look at what events people might enjoy doing. One of the first things we did was an archery taster and then a sailing taster. You've organised quite a few. I mean, you've done, I see, sausage making to juggling to exploring railway tunnels. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, the sausage making was interesting because there's a very nice farm nearby, but they do sausage making workshops and they charge about £40 per person. And I thought there must be a cheaper way of doing this because I've, I've set uh, a limit of roughly £20 per activity. I wanted to be inclusive, you know, rather than an exclusive club. So I found a sausage making kit online where you get the piping bag and the skins 
bought everything online. Then we hired a, a, a hall, a church hall, and we uh, invited everyone along. And it was it was a great event. And were, the, were the sausages nice? They were. So everybody made about a pound of sausages. Some people had made them really spicy. Others with vegetarian stuff. And yeah, it was really good. How did the juggling go? Was that difficult? That, that went well. That was much the same kind of thing. One of our members uh, can juggle and he can do the hoop thing as well. Everyone got their own set of juggling balls and we kind of introduced people to it slowly. So by the end of the morning, we were getting people pretty close to juggling three balls. It's taking, it's taking something that's not expensive, hopefully, and just giving people that little opportunity to, to do it. What happened in the railway tunnel? Um, we've got an old railway line which runs from Harborough to Northampton. It's called the Brampton Valley Way. Uh, it goes through two unlit tunnels. So I've cycled through it several times. And I said to my group, would you like to come along and, and see what it's like to be in that tunnel in the dark? Went with our torches to start with. But then when we got into the middle of the tunnel, I turned, turned all the tur- torches off. The, the little party trick, though, that they weren't prepared for, I'd got one of these little MP3 players with a steam train sound on it. So once it was pitch black, I said to people, imagine what it was like when the steam trains were coming through here. And just click this little thing on and people leapt out of their skin, Peter, I can tell you. But apart from frightening people in railway tunnels, um, <laughs> I see you've also done some axe throwing as well. Axe throwing, yes. Well, that was one that we did have to do as an organised activity, obviously. I, I, I checked our insurance, and although the Third Age Trust covers us for most activities, that was one of the kind of high-risk things that we had to do as an organised event. There was a lady that came with us who's a very good darts player, and she was just absolute natural at throwing these axes the rest of us struggled a bit because the theory of it is that they have to get this axe to to turn just once when you throw it well of course the rest of us were throwing it all over the place and hitting the hitting the board with the handle and all kinds of stuff but it, again it was a great experience a great experience what have you got planned for the future over the next three months we're going uh, to have a game of croquet uh, then we're doing another sailing tester, sailing and stand-up paddleboarding. And I see you've also done some narrow boating. Yes, yes, that was good. Most people had a go at, at steering it. <laughs> well, we didn't crash, so that was that was good. That was good. So who, who comes up with all the ideas? Is it this duo or is it the group? It's the group. It's the group. Yeah. So they they keep saying, "Oh, Kev, can we do this? And can we do that?" And it's it's really nice. Everyone chips in with ideas. I see you've got about 80 members. So yes. all 80 members come on each experience? No, no. Thankfully, <laughs> we, we have quite a mixture of people. So some are, are quite athletic and like doing the, the active stuff. Others are more arty and they'll, they'll do the glass fusing and glass painting and things like that. You see, you appear to do everything, really. Didn't you? <laughs> well, I've had a go at yeah, lots and lots of things. Kevin Millard from the New Experiences Group at Harborough Welland U3A. However, if axe throwing is not your thing, maybe you'd like to join something more sedate, such as the classic car group at Kennet U3A in Wiltshire. It's been set up by Ashley de Safrin, the owner of a sporty Mercedes and an elegant Rolls Royce. Joanne Watson, whose little runabout certainly wouldn't qualify, asked Ashley for his definition of a classic car very flexible. We have cars in the group that go back to 1910. There's a steam car, which is exceptionally unusual. And I don't know what the latest car would be, probably 1990s, if I had to guess. I think a lot of people believe classic cars need to be over 20 years old. So that would sort of fit into that category. But we're not trying to exclude anyone, sort of very keen on anyone who's keen on classic cars, basically, and owns one. So what do you do in a group meeting or group event? (laughs) It's very informal, but we tend to either visit car shows, we visit country houses. The one key thing is there's always a lunch involved somewhere at one of the pubs. But it's become very much a social group. We're now 20 plus members, plus their partners, which for one of these groups is is a reasonable size. And they're a very proactive group, which is great. I always imagine, because I'm not a car fanatic, that 
you spend half your time because they are quite old cars under the bonnet, sort of replacing this, replacing that. Am I, am I completely on the wrong track here? Some are very technical, some totally untechnical. I am probably one of the least technical people in the group. You know, we have one uh, 89-year-old who still does his car servicing, and he's as fit as anything. So it, it varies, but a lot of them are quite interested in the peculiarities of their particular make of car. You mentioned you've got an owner that's got a car that dates back to the beginning of the uh, 20th century. How difficult is it? Is it for him? For a car like that, it's difficult, and, and we can only go so he can only go a certain distance. But for others, we can sort of manage quite long drives if we need to. Uh, one of our members has volunteered to organise a classic car drive in August this year. It's going to be about 100 miles long, so that's quite a long drive. Uh, and that will include probably coffee at the starting uh, venue and lunch somewhere in between, and maybe even afternoon tea, I don't know, because I haven't seen the, the, the route yet. And, and most classic car owners can manage that without a problem. But the, the 1910 car, not. I've seen a picture of it. It looks as if it's sort of a giant kettle, to be quite honest. <laughs> You'd have to talk to him about that. That's an interesting, interesting comment. <laughs> Probably is. But the um, origin of the word chauffeur was literally someone who put the coal into the cars of the era, you know, from the French chauffeur, um, a heater, or whatever. So <laughs> I suppose in, in his case, that might apply. And what sort of miles per gallon do you do on these some of these cars? I would imagine it, it's not great, not, am I you, wrong? You don't, you don't buy them for economy, that's for sure. I mean, one of the cars we have is an old Rolls-Royce of the 1960s, and that does about 14 miles to the gallon, maybe less on some occasions. Some cars are much more economic, probably the majority, to be honest, but, uh, but I know ours isn't particularly. You have a, a, a lovely looking Rolls Royce. Explain what it's like when someone comes and sees one of your cars, because I would imagine that it's, it's like sort of falling in love if you're, if you're a car fanatic. <laughs> the cars look great and, and people do, of course, come up or they, or they take pictures either sort of obviously or sort of uh, furtively. Uh, yes, people are fascinated by these cars. I mean, they're, they're fascinated by all classic cars, to be honest, but some do have a certain presence, and the Rolls-Royce definitely does, and, and pe people love these cars for all sorts of different reasons. Why do you love your cars? The Mercedes I love driving. The Rolls-Royce is a bit harder to drive. It, it, it's partly the, the sort of the, the social aspects to it, partly because, you know, it's like a nice painting. You like the look of the car. You like the way the car drives. Uh, some people like their cars because of the engines. Uh, the one thing you don't necessarily like your car for is the costs involved. <laughs> and, you know, certainly the Rolls-Royce, every time you take it to a garage, costs a fortune to repair, and that's the nature of the beast. Uh, whereas the, the, the other car we've got isn't quite so bad. Uh, but there is always a risk whenever you travel that it could break down. Uh, and then you've got to hope either that there's a, an AA nearby or that there's someone who knows something about these cars. Is it something that is particularly British or is this a sort of uh, thrill seekers worldwide ink? It's a thrill seekers worldwide. I think the British are probably stronger than some. I think the Germans are pretty strong in this. The French probably less so. But I mean, if you look at the, the Rolls Royce Club, they have branches in South Africa, in many parts of Europe. There's an American equivalent. In America, classic cars are very, very big. And you have all sorts of concourse, uh, delegates, uh, shows in California and other places. And, and these cars are quite amazing, apparently. You know, we have a neighbour here in the village and he's planning to do a Paris to Peking rally sometime when once COVID is sort of totally over, if ever. And, and that's a special thing that uh, brings people from all over the world. So it's not just a, a British thing, but the British are very keen on these, on these sort of classic uh, events. Ashley Le Safrin from Kennet U3A in Wiltshire, making us all rather jealous, although I must admit my car does rather more miles to the gallon. Before we drive off into the sunset, can I remind you that we're after royal memories for this Platinum Jubilee year, particularly if you were at the coronation in 1953, or indeed if you've ever met the Queen. Please let us know by emailing communications at u3a.org.uk. That's communications at u3a.org.uk. UK. My thanks to Ella Watts, Peter Cliff, Joanne Watson and Sarah Goodall for the interviews and also to Ella for producing the podcast. Until next time, this is Nick Bailey saying goodbye.